I'm Sherry Cabral, so I'm uh, with my uh, par partner in crime, Patrick Galbraith. We're going to be uh, doing this workshop on understanding how MySQL works by understanding metadata. Um, the original title of this was I Never Met a Data I Didn't Like, but uh, they weren't sure that everybody would, they wanted something that was a little more descriptive, so you could look at the title and figure it out, but uh, I'm still partial to I Never Met a Data I Didn't Like. Um, and basically, Patrick and I have actually both finished uh, writing books, uh, both for Wiley Press. Um, my book is uh, called the MySQL Administrator Bible, um, and Patrick, and it's on. It's basically a, a guide to be beginner um, DBAs, whether or not you're a beginner my, uh, DBA or not. It's a, for MySQL. So if you know Oracle really well and you're going over to um, MySQL, it's not a book full of here's how to do a select statement. Um, that's kind of how it's writ uh, written, so that anybody can pick it up and not be bored by it, even if they know other databases. In your book? Mine is developing web applications using Memcache, MySQL, Perl, and Apache. Um, I, the, I forget the exact order from day to day. I have to look at it myself. But it's basically about developing web applications using those three, four technologies, as well as Sphinx and Beerman and some newer technologies. And besides, you know, being blatant plugs for, you know, our books and whatnot, when's yours coming out? July. July. Mine's actually coming out in a couple of weeks in mid-May. So besides being blatant plugs for it, the, the reason this tutorial actually came about was because when I was looking at things like the information schema to document it for this, for the book, I realized that I was actually learning so much about it that I didn't even know. And I've, I've been a MySQL DBA for like, um, what did I say, eight years now. When Patrick originally did the slide, he said 12 plus years of MySQL. I was like, that's... That's great. I'm a, I'm a little young for that, but uh, so it's eight years of it's actually eight years of experience um, using MySQL, which is actually like a veteran. And you know, unless you've actually written some of MySQL, I think that's pretty much you know some of the older, old school kind of uh, you know working with it. So I even learned a lot about features I didn't know. Um, the, to check some that I had described in the uh, in the abstract is one of them, where there's an automatic checksumming feature for MySQL for my ISM tables. Um, I didn't even know about that. Um, and I actually had to figure out what it was because it was in the information schema and I had to document it for the book. So just looking at um, the, uh, the data is, going to, is a big deal. Um, one thing we haven't done is upload this. I'm going to upload this presentation um, sometime when I have a couple of free moments and uh, then you guys can all download it. So I, we will tell before, probably before intermission, but definitely when we come back from intermission um, so that you guys don't have to be crazy writing down every single word. Um, if you guys do have a laptop, feel free to follow along in your own local MySQL instance, type some of these commands so that you can see. We're going to be doing a lot of showing, you know, commands and all that kind of stuff. So a little bit about me. Um, I am a MySQL team lead at the Pythian Group. We do remote database management, so I manage databases for 15 different companies. Um, I wrote this uh, Bible, and you can go to tinyurl.com slash MySQL Bible, and it goes to the Amazon page to pre-order it. Um, and uh, I, you might have noticed that I'm videoing uh, this session up front, so uh, you can go in a probably three or four weeks. It ends up being when I edit all the videos. Technovation.org will have them. Um, if you read Planet MySQL, you'll see. And actually, um, there is one. Um, can you get up the Forge page? There's actually a page on the on the MySQL Forge where there's all the sessions that exist, um, and you can link if you write a blog post or you. Um, you know, have audio or video or, or you know, just notes, um, you can actually uh, see that. So let me uh, drive because I know where it is. Come on. It's actually in the wiki. Uh, can you switch your thing? So if you go to forge.myscale.com slash wiki, um, here's the conference and expo 2009. We'll click to it. Um, and if you go to schedules, videos, notes, whatever from the conference, you can see by day. So we would go to like Monday. And uh, here we go. So where is this? Understanding my voice. So here, I could actually edit down here and put in slides, a link to wherever the slides are. I so. Don't work for <laughs> yeah, the work for Grazer anymore. We'll change that too when we change the slides. Can you just switch back? Yes. All right. So, enough about me. On to Patrick. I am a principal software engineer at Lycos. Lycos has got a historical name. I'm sure many of you have heard of it. I wonder... What it might be easier to read here. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. <laughs> um, I've been... Uh, Lycos uh, 
yes, we are still around. We do a lot of exciting things. I've just recently released uh, PHP and MySQL functionality for tripod users for premium accounts, something that they've been wanting for a long time, and now we provide it. Um, I have been doing open source for 16 years. I One long weekend, I stayed home and downloaded Linux onto 26 floppies on my Packard Bell, and from then on, that's what I've been doing. Uh, uh, just finished authoring this book by Wiley, Developing Web Applications Using Apache, Memcache, MySQL, and Perl. Um, it'll, it's basically a book that covers almost everything you'd want to know about doing web applications. And it goes into detail about MySQL tasks as well. And, and like she was saying that she looked, she, when she was using information schema and learning about metadata for writing about her book, I, the same thing came, came upon me. I realized there's a lot of useful information in there. And the same, the same holds true at Lycos. When I was implementing this MySQL functionality, I had to write an application that made it available for users to see what databases they had available and they could create and drop databases. And instead of using the old show commands, I actually looked into information schema and it's been really helpful. Um, I have some other open source projects that I work on. The Federated Storage Engine, Memcache Functions for MySQL, DVD MySQL, a couple others. So you've probably used some of Patrick's software, um, especially with the DVD MySQL, but you may not have heard of Patrick, but now you know what uh, I'm what's known as thing. Captain Tofu in the community. <laughs> I'm an omnivore, so, you know. So what is metadata? Um, metadata is data about data. Um, so basically, this tutorial is actually a tutorial, it's actually session for this conference number 5682. Um, and one of the things that, you know, if you wanted to like uh, Twitter about this saying, hey, pound my SQL comp, I'm at 5682 and it's awesome. And that's a way actually that they can get feedback. If you go to, um, let's see, uh, mysqlconf.com and you look at the uh, abstract for this page, at the top it's like session slash proposal slash, you know, 5682. Um, so what is, you know, what are some of the examples in MySQL? Things like a row count, how many, how many rows are in the table? That's, there's, that's an element of data and it's about the, the data that's actually in the table. Um, and then, you know, data type, for example, is another one. So, Basically, this whole workshop is about trying to figure out what things do based on what you see. Um, so if you see something that says uh, this variable is on or off, then you can conclude, okay, it's something that you can turn on and off. And most probably, there's actually a flag that says turn it on, turn it off. In some cases, there won't be. So basically, there's not a lot of harm you can do with reading stuff, but you might be wrong. So read, the, you know, look at something, try to get a sense of how it's going, but you know, also ask people, you know, figure out if there's something that you can do about it. So do your playing, any playing on non-production systems. Um, but this is just kind of trying to figure out based on what we have, just playing a detective. So we're going to be using some commands in uh, when we do some of the demos here. Um, backslash bang or backslash black backslash exclamation point is something that you can use on non-Windows machine to escape a command and actually run the command on shell. So for instance, I'll show you here, and I should probably make this a slightly bigger, which I will do when the window comes up. Here we go. Because I'm sure you guys can't all see that. Uh, can you? You can't see that, right? If anyone wants to shout out how I do this, feel free as a profiles. Yeah. Oh, yeah, here we go. Don't use the system with, with fonts. Oh, there you go. Let's go to like 22. Is that better? Can everyone see that? Okay, close that. So if I do MySQL, you guys can all see my password. Um, so if I do backslash bang ls, it gives me the ls of my home directory or ls temp or backslash bang date. I'm doing this all from within the command line. So, yeah, that's nice and big. Um, other, other useful commands, which I will get back to that, are uh, backslash c. So backslash c um, will cancel something. So let's say I've got uh, select uh, count star from tables. Well, I realize, wait, I haven't actually done gone into a database right now. 
So I'm going to cancel this by doing backslash C. Nothing happened. And so now I'm going to go to, you know, use information schema. And then I can just go back here and hit semicolon because it's saved in the, in the um, buffer for me to go back up. So it can be really useful when you're writing like a, you know, half a page query and realize you have to go back and do something and you just kind of want to cancel it, but you want it to still be on the screen so you can copy and paste later or whatever. Backslash C is pretty useful because um, I'm always forgetting that if there was one thing that I, I forgot to do. Um, also, you probably already know about uh, select now, which will give you the date. Um, you may or may not know about the sleep command. So if I do select sleep five, it's going to sleep for five seconds and then come back. So that's pretty useful if you're waiting for something. Um, but if you notice it does this sleep five and it gives you this zero returned. Um, there's also the do command, which will run a command just like select, runs any select command, but it doesn't give you any output. So instead of getting all that output that I didn't even need, it just says, okay, zero rows effective. That could be uh, a useful command. Um, so now that we're back here. So part of the metadata that we're going to start looking at is files. So there's a bunch of files that are associated with MySQL. Configuration files like the etsy.my.cnf or my.ini if you're on Windows. Um, the data and index and FRM files that go along with tables. We'll be exploring those um, a lot to kind of figure out how storage engines even work. Um, there are temporary files, logs, general logs, slow logs, binary relay logs. And they're all, they all have metadata information, how you can learn about how things work. Uh, for example, the binary logs, inside the binary logs, you have a timestamp. You also um, have the user who, uh, who did things. And if you look at the timestamp, um, that's actually how commands like current timestamp and now are replication safe, right? If I have something that's three hours, if you have a slave that's three hours behind the master, when it goes to do current timestamp or now and it inserts it in there, won't it have a problem? No, because it actually sets the timestamp of each command to be the same as the master. So it'll say, in the binary logs, it says timestamp equals, you know, a number. And that will, that's the timestamp that that command actually ran at. So it's pretty useful. Um, other me metadata besides files, uh, system variables and status variables. You guys probably all have seen, you know, show global status, show global variables. Um, the tables in the information schema are a lot. And there's also a bunch of uh, status commands that aren't, that aren't encapsulated in the information schema. So, for example, there are many, um, there's many show commands like show tables or show databases that you can also get from using the information schema database, but there's a whole bunch that aren't like show slave status. There's no other way to get that slave status information other than show slave status. So that's all, it's got metadata as well. So, um, going good? All right, so let's talk about the files. Um, you know, we're here for the duration. So with data and index files, um, some storage engines store the data index together. Some storage engines store them separately. Some storage engines don't have indexes. Some storage in engines don't have data. Um, the table data dictionary file is the .frm file. Um, FRM kind of stands for format. Um, so we, the, uh, the reason that MySQL can do a really easy show create table and it shows you the statement is that information is actually kept in the .frm file. Um, and then there are also log files. So some of the tools that we're going to use are we're going to use uh, tools like ls, uh, for file size, or ls-l actually, we're going to look at the dates of the file, see when things were changed, because if we insert data into a file, into a uh, table, and a file doesn't change, then that file doesn't have the data in it. So just knowing that, you can see, okay, what happens to this file when I do that? Are they related? Um, and we actually have found some pretty surprising things when we actually did this. Um, and then also the file content, you can look at the file content through more, uh, you can't look at the file content through date, um, so that's probably something that I did wrong on the slide. Um, you can actually use the file command to see what kind of file type it is. So if I go here and I go to um, var lib mysql, this is my data directory, um, and I go into the test database, and then I do file um, fedtest.frm. It's a MySQL table definition file version 9. That's pretty neat that 
you know, my operating system just knows that. Um, we also said ls-l is one of, uh, is another command. Um, and what were the other, what was the other one? Uh, strings, certainly. Strings, right. Strings. So is strings is an interesting uh, command. So you can do a strings on a file. Like if I, we go back to my home directory, you know, and I say, um, here is a test to show how strings works. And if I do string, so if I do more foo, obviously I can do more. If I do file foo, the thing about more is that you don't want to more a file that's not text. You don't want to more a binary file that can end up messing up your whole display. So you, you first see, okay, what kind of a file? Is, oh, ASCII task, I, text, I can do a more on it. But if we didn't know what it was, for instance, if I gzip foo, right, and we do more, we're going to find some junk, right? So we can actually do strings, and it gives us junk because it's compressed. But we unzip it, we get strings, and we put the right file name, and it says here's a test to show how strings works. So you can get strings out of strings. The, but the, tri the tricky thing with strings is that uh, by default, it has a, a, a minimum number of four. So if you have, for instance, you have a states table, and you have NY for New York, and you do a strings on a data table, and you're hoping to see NY. It's not going to appear, but you can feed it the, the dash um, number command and give it a minimum string. So if you want to see all of them, like for instance, two for NY for New York. So that's just something to be cognizant of. And uh, basically what Patrick is saying is there's a length, there's a length issue with strings. So files that are longer than uh, four, char four characters or more will actually show up. Strings foo. But if you see this, here's a test. So I just changed the file and added some more lines. We only get two lines here. The here's a test to show how strings work and A, B, C, D. But if we actually look at foo, it actually has a blank line A, A, B, A, B, C. So if the line is three characters or less, strings won't show it, um, which actually gave us quite an interesting, you know, we did strings on a table and we're like, why is it missing a row? We thought it was a problem with, you know, MySQL or something. It's, a, it's just a strings issue. Um, there is a command to show everything. Um, to show you can set the minimum length, um, but it's it's a good caution to know your tools because if you're depending on your tools to come up with some information, uh, you want to make sure that your tools are that you know what your tools are giving you so that you know exactly the information that the tools are giving you. So, and file and strings can't be used on win Windows. Um, who here is using Windows in production for MySQL? In production, okay. How many people have it as a uh, desktop? Okay, great, okay. So, um, a .frm file, um, something that you were going to, uh, yeah, yeah. Yes, um, as we said, they're the, the data dictionary files. Do you want to switch yours? Or? Yeah. I'll leave yours up and okay. then I'll, I'll do the, uh, when I get to the command line. Great. Um, they, they basically show you how the table's put together. It, it has the table definition in it. And as we said, it is the format. And you can, you can look at this file by Actually, I can do the I can do the demo while you do. Okay, this. sure, yeah. You know, as as we see here, she'll show you that if you do a, a, a strings on it, you can see what's inside of it. There's a lot of binary stuff in there if you just viewed it with an editor, but with strings, we can kind of see what's in there and get an idea of how the table is put together. Okay, so if we're gonna do a create table states. Yep. Uh, state ID. Int unsigned, not null. Uh, state name, var car 100, not null. Engine, close my isom. Uh, you have SQL set, uh, non null. Okay, now we can do an uh, ls varlib mysql uh, test. So let's do an ls-l, and it says we have states.frm, states.my, and states.myd. They were all just just recently. And there's no data in there, as you can see with the zero length. The frm file and the index file has some header information that's in there, so it, it, is have, it does have something in it. So let's see what file types these all are. Test slash star. So let's say we didn't know anything about tables at all. We didn't know MYI. We don't know what MYD, MYI, FRMR. 
Um, this actually tells us, right, MYD is empty, so it doesn't actually tell us what kind of a tech, uh, uh, file it is. But this actually says it's my ICM compressed data. Now, this we know is index data, but it's, it's data. And then you've got this table definition file version 10. So it's telling you that what, what the files are. If we do a strings on um, states, strings, uh, what was I doing? States, uh, FRM. Yeah, we can see right now. Um, you can see the table definite the table definition. You can see the columns that are in there. Um, you can see also it, it indicates that it's a my ISAM type table. And the next thing we'll do is we'll we'll alter it. We'll add uh, an index to it. Um, so if we, no, we're going to create a federated table. Oh, right, okay. Yes, we're going to go to federated. We're going to show you uh, what FRM looks like for some of the other storage engines. And federated is interesting because with federated, there's not an actual data file. What it is is a, a URL type connection string that tells you where the remote table is, giving the connection information. So, you know, we're not going to be all fancy here. We're just going to create a uh, federated table that points to... Um, that points to the state table we just made. But only if I can copy and paste properly. Really? Okay. I'm going to do this. Probably would be faster to type it at this point. Why is it on my space to paint? But, okay, I know that's in my copy and paste buffer. So, create table, fed test, state ID, and engine federated. The only, there's no, the only information other than the, we're only um, showing the state ID. The only information other than that is connection equals, here's the, uh, here's the connection information. Okay. So, let's see what we just did. You'll see there's no index or data file for this one. There's just a, an FRM file. Which makes sense because the data and the indexes are all remotely. And you can see here the other information. You know, before it says federated up here and it has the column names just like before, but it also has this information. So the FRM file has not just um, the kind, the table type of the storage engine, it has other information as it pertains to a particular. Um, storage engine. This allows MySQL to know how to connect and whenever you issue queries against this table it, it'll go to that URL, obtain a result set, bring it back and turn it into the internal MySQL format and display the results as if the table were local. Alrighty. I think this is we're getting into where we actually add indexes back okay. to the states table. So let's say you don't know anything about my ISM table. You don't actually know that MYD is data and MYI is index, right? Um, you'll see here what we're going to do is we're going to insert one row into this table. And then we're going to observe what changes do we see on the file system to the FRM file, the MYD file, and the MYI file. And what we should see is the, the, the format file should not change. The index file should also not change because we haven't yet defined any indexes. What we should see, however, is that the MYD file is no longer a length of zero and it has data in it. So the first thing we want to look at is the date, and then the size, and then what actually is inside of the state's MYD file. Okay, so here we looked at the information. We have the information before we did any inserts. So we created it, you know, five minutes ago. Uh, then we did an insert, and now we're looking at the files. This file wasn't changed. The FRM file, that makes sense. We didn't change the table or whatever. So even if you didn't know anything about the FRM file, I can say, aha, whenever I add data, the FRM file doesn't change. It only, and we'll show later that it changes when you do an alter. Um, similarly, and this is actually interesting, so we don't have any indexes in this table, and yet the index file changed. 
Okay, it w but it didn't change that much because it was 1024 oh, the date. Yeah. characters before, and now it's still 1024, well, bytes. It's still 1024 bytes. Whereas the data was empty. Here's the data, and it's empty. And now it's 20 bytes long. So, what's going on? It, I believe what happens is it touched it and might have tried to re index it, even though there aren't indexes included in it. It's just in the internal way that the storage engine works. It's the row count. It's, it is, in fact, the row count. Thank you. Somebody said it's the row count. My ISOM actually um, keeps the uh, metadata properly inside of it. Um, and it might also have like a pointer to the first row or something. But yeah, it's the row count. It's stored in there. So, I mean, we, we had a huge surprise. We didn't even think about that. And we had to th sit and think and go, why is it that the index file change when you add data? That should never happen. But it did. So it, it was it was one of these things that, you know, for all we know, with the years of experience, we didn't even stop to consider that. But it's, you know, something that doesn't happen with other tables um, because MySM has the exact statistics and they get updated um, when, that, uh, when that happens. So if we do a strings on the um, index file, uh, states.myi, we don't get anything. And that's probably because um, it's, if, the index, it's the row count is just one, so it's not showing. So if we do a more on it, it's actually garbage. We can't actually tell. So we can't figure out if it's actually the row count, but we, we can figure maybe there's something related to it. So um, if we do a strings on uh, states.myd, we see now there's Alaska's in there. So the data actually got in there. The next step is for us to actually add a primary key and a secondary index to see what uh, changes are made to the index file and the data file and the FRM file. So we're going to add a primary key on state ID. Alrighty, that was done. And uh, if we do a secondary string, okay, yeah, we want to check ls l. We can see what changed. Okay, the format file, everything changed, which makes sense. The format file changed because we've changed the format. We've added it, you know, we've changed the structure of the table. Um, this, the data has changed, but it hasn't actually changed the amount. Again, it probably just touched it, looked at it. Um, and the MYI has changed and gotten bigger, doubled in size, which makes total sense because we've now actually added a data structure with a record in it. The next thing we do is to uh, insert some values in there. What do so you want? Index? Oh, yeah, we a need to add the index? secondary index. Yes. This time we're going to add it against state name. Now we observe what, what has changed. Again. again. <laughs> yeah, we've changed everything. And again, you know, 1401, the .myd file changed, but, you know, it kept, kept the same number of characters. Um, also, the index file has changed now. And now got it even bigger. Indexing. Well, it added another index. Right. So it got even bigger. <coughs> so let's see what happens when we uh, change data. The sleep was in there in case it took, didn't take a whole minute to actually type out the command. We'd have to like sleep for 60 seconds. Otherwise, we wouldn't know if it was touched in that minute or was touched the previous command. Um, so if we're just going to... You know, enter in uh, two Alabama, three uh, NY. This is the original problem we had, where you know NY wouldn't show up, and it was we didn't know what was going on. We were like, how does MySQL know that NY is you know an abbreviation? So we're just going to put a couple of states in there, um, and let's see what happened. Okay, 14.02, we we put states in there again. The FRM file didn't change. But the index file changed, makes sense, because it's indexing all the data that we added. Um, and the .myd file changed, and we added a whole bunch of data. And if we look at what's in there, actually, too. Oh, do a string, OK. And this was the interesting thing while we were doing this. We realized you could see the, how indexes work at a file system level. So if we look at states.frm, no, uh, did I, oh, I know what I did. We now have a primary key, and we also have a key on state name. These are actually different. We should have probably showed that 
four times, but the primary, it's, not, it's a primary key on state ID, so it just says primary. Try a dash in, you'll see. Oh, I string just dash n Yeah, two. just as we walked into the... Dash n2. And now here it says dd. No idea what that is. That's probably some junk, but you can see uh, state ID in there now. And yes. No, yeah, the, part of the, field, the, the, the smaller amount of characters you use, the more likely you're going to see garbage. So, you know, it's kind of a give or take. Uh, but if we do the strings on uh, states.myd, now we'll see New York, whereas before we didn't. Yeah, that's kind of handy. And you'll see that the data in the myd file is in the order that we inserted it. But if we now look at the myi file, the index file, uh, we'll see lots of garbage. In <laughs> Well, I did a dash in too. Yeah. If we do this, it's actually in alphabetical order. And you're, you're looking at this and wondering why is it that there's test uh, pound SQL in there? That's because when we did the alter table, it created, when you run an alter table, it, it basically creates a temp file um, of the new table format, copies the data there, and then drops the old table and then moves the, old, the, the temporary table over as the, the permanent table. And so you'll see that referenced in there. Mm -hmm. And of course, you know, it makes sense that the data file is just putting it in order. You know, we put Alaska, then Alabama, but obviously alphabetically, it's Alabama and then Alaska. And of course, it makes sense that the index file stores it in order. But again, if you knew absolutely nothing about index files, whatever, you could actually figure out what these files are doing based on this stuff. You could actually figure out, hey, this must be the index file because it's in order. And when you added an index, it changed the size of the file and all that kind of stuff. So. Um, that's just kind of the power of, uh, of metadata. So it's all basically what conclusions can we draw based on what we see these files doing. Um, you know, the FRM is a data dictionary file and it's for every table. There's every table, there's an FRM file. It doesn't matter what kind of storage engine um, it actually is. So whether it's black hole or federated, now we saw federated, it only had a format file, which made sense. Um, similarly, black hole tables, which are a black hole, there's no data, that only has an FRM file. Again, makes sense because there's no need for a data file. Um, memory, in memory tables, only have a .FRM file. Again, doesn't make any sense to have a data file um, because they don't store any, any data on the local disk. So just to illustrate that point, if we create table black hole test, um, you know, id int, um, engine equals black hole. We've created a table. Um, let's just uh, live my SQL test. And we can see that black hole test, just an FRM, and we just created it. Um, we can do a strings on it. Not very, um, not very informative, but, you know, again, black hole. Um, and what else there? Oh, so if we insert into the black hole engine, black hole test, uh, ID, values, one, two. Okay, we've inserted some data, but, you know, it's now, you know, 1406, and yet at 1405, you know, we can insert again. Uh, you know, select now, uh, CS yeah, select now. Okay, we know that it definitely was 1406 when I did the command, and it's still 1405, so it hasn't even tried to insert it into anything. It's just, the, it's the FRM file, it doesn't change, and there's no other data files for it because it's black hole. So, views. Views also just have a .FRM file because views are, there's never a materialized view, never a view that saves the data. It just always goes back and does um, the actual data on the tables that are there. Um, so there's no way to cache that information. So if I do a create view, I need that. Odd states. Uh, we're going to just get all of the states with an odd ID. Uh, state and select state name from states where state ID uh, mod 2 equals 1. And uh, if we just want to see what it does, then there you go. We only get, well, we can get the state ID 2. 
1, 3, and 5. So if I create new odds dates, that's just what it's going to do. So I start from odds dates, and I just get the three state names. Uh, I hit from twice. There you go. So, actually, let me do this. CD var load my SQL test since I keep having to type that. Um, and then if I just do a backslash bang, lrth, what recently changed? Odd states at frm. So, let's do a strings on odd states at frm and see what it looks like. Oops. There's a lot of stuff in here. So, we've got type equals view, which, you know, great, as opposed to storage engine is, you know, black hole federated or whatever. Uh, here's the query that's actually running to do the query itself. So, you can see it actually has filled in the database name. It's escaping everything. Um, so, this is actually how, you know, it's sending the query. Um, the view is updatable. Uh, the algorithm is zero. I mean, you can look at views to look at the algorithm and how it works. Um, that's a... Uh, it's like a pool where it will push down the data or um, whatever. So the user was root, the, the, local ho the host was localhost, SUID2. Um, there is no check option on this, which you can actually kind of fake check constraints with views. Um, this is all just, you know, here when it was created. Here's the source. This is what I actually typed in. Um, and then, you know, this was the client connection um, character set name and the client collation name when. I had done it and then, you know, the view body. So there's a lot, there's actually tons of stuff in the FRM for a view um, that doesn't even exist in the uh, FRM for other things. Some other databases probably would have the view actually stored inside of the database and the database diction dictionary. With uh, MySQL, it's in that file. And that, that probably gives it a little bit of speed. Um, it might not adhere to the, you know, putting everything in the database. But, uh, and it also makes it so that when MySQL reads it, it sees it as a table, but then it knows it's a view and it allows it to function as, as such. Yeah. Um, so CSV files, we can kind of go through this quickly. Um, we'll create a, create a uh, CSV table. So create table CSV test ID int engine equals CSV file uh, CSV test star. Oops, ls dash l, csv test star first. So if the backslash uh, doesn't work for Windows, anything funny? No, backslash bang does not work for Windows, but it works for everything else, which for Mac OS, Linux, Solaris. There is not a way to do that as kind of escape from from Windows. Okay, but it's not simple. Not, there's nothing no way yet. There's no way to do it, unfortunately. Um, but as you can see, it's very useful, especially instead of typing exit and going back and forth or having two windows. It's just very, very handy to have. Mm -hmm. So we created this CSV test, and it's actually got three things. And one of them doesn't, I mean, one of them's CSV, so maybe that's the data itself, because we know that CSV stores data in, in a comma separated values file. But what's the CSM thing? That's not an index. CSV file doesn't actually allow any indexes on it. If I try to um, alter table CSV test, add index on um, ID, too many keys specified, max zero keys allowed. So it's not an index file, so what is it? Well, if we look at CSM, it says table definition file version zero. That looks a little suspect to me. I don't know. Um, the data itself is empty and the format file is file version nine. Okay. So let's do a strings on CSV test dot CSM because it's got like 35 characters in it, whatever, nothing. Okay, let's do a more on it. Okay, nothing. Hmm. Got, a, got a joker card. Weird, we have, we have no idea what, uh, what it is. Let's uh, insert some data into CSV and see what changes. ID, oops. You guys can just call right out when I make a, a typo or something. So I know you guys are also awake and everything. Um, it's kind of cold in here. Our fingers are freezing. Up. Yeah. <laughs> so we're going to add some, you know, values. Okay. Uh, let's go back here. Shockingly enough, we have now six six uh, bytes in the CSV test. Okay, that makes sense. Um, this changed, but it's the same size. 
So why does that change? I don't know. Well, let's try adding some more data. Oh, and let's see what select now. It's uh, 14.13, so let's insert some more data because now we know that it's been a whole minute. Um, and, okay, that's weird. So the data changed the first time we added data, but it didn't change the second time we added data. So we have a little mystery on our hands. Okay. So, um, we've done some inserting. Uh, and uh, we looked at the strings, we looked at the file. So, anyone have any idea? No? Yeah, we didn't either. We looked up. It's basically a, um, what was it, a management file? Yeah. It's so. What if we do a strings on it now? Has the, in, the, the, the internals of it changed at all? I'm guessing not, since it's the same exact size. Okay, I can do that. Uh, strings. Nope. nope. Still nothing. So it could very well, why did it uh, have it uh, change for the first set of data? Well, if it's a management table, it probably is a pointer to the first row of information. Um, and we actually played around with it to see, like, Maybe it's going to the lowest number of information. If you put something like negative one, it doesn't actually change the file. So it's just the first, literally the first insert. So, oh, actually, um, it's actually for metadata like statistics, too. Um, and what we did find out, actually, is if we end up doing a check table or analyze table on, on the table itself, it actually didn't change it. So you do tech, check table, CSV test, dot CSM, no, nope, CSV test. Okay, we wouldn't think of it that it wouldn't be okay. Um, and now if we do an LS-L, we can see that it, it didn't change because the check doesn't actually write anything to the file, to a statistics file, it just checks the table. So if we do analyze table, CSV test, the storage engine doesn't even support analyze, and yet at 1415, now that file changed. So I'm not quite sure why it doesn't support analyze, but then it touched the file. But if you do an optimize to CSV test, actually select now, uh, do sleep 15. And basically by the time that we finish doing this, um, we'll do an optimize table and we'll see that it actually still changes, even <laughs> though I think it still doesn't support optimize. So. <coughs> I, I think it might support repair. I think once I, I mess with a It could be. But it's interesting up. that it yeah. writes to the CSM file even though it doesn't support the table. Yeah, there are some standard things that MySQL does regardless of what type of storage engine. It's just part of the way that it works. Oops. Right. CSV test. So it will, yeah, because I, I typed dot CSM. Oh, okay. So let's go on to archive tables. Um, if we create an archive database, we actually get two files, a .frm and a .arz. Let's see if I can get this to work. So creating table archive test, again, id int name arc 32 engine is archive, um, and what was just created, a .arz file and a .frm file. We know .frm is a format. Let's see if there's anything neat in the um, archive test format. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for our said shebang. I heard it. Uh, so again, it does the same thing, just the, uh, the table type and then the names. Um, so let's see what's in the ARZ file. It's got data. No other data files have had data before. Okay, it has some like, it actually puts in the header, it puts the, the column information, which we haven't really had in any other table type. Pretty interesting. Um, so let's insert into, uh, let's insert some data because that's all we can really do with an archive table. Um, so ID name, uh, values, uh, one, you know, Patrick, two, Shiri, and uh, three, somebody shout out a name? Ronald. Ronald, okay. I kind of meant not you, but that's okay. Oops. Trying to make sure they're still awake. I hope. <laughs> what? Thanks, Patrick. <laughs> thanks, yeah, thanks. You're welcome. Uh, and Bob. 
So, you know, we've got some stuff in here, and let's um, let's look and see what happens. Uh, what do we have? Archive. Okay. Uh, so the data changed. Let's see if it didn't select now. Uh, 1418. Did I not insert into archive test? Oh, you know what? The um, file system didn't update yet. It takes sometimes it takes a couple of minutes. I don't know why. For but this happened before where I was like, hmm, that sometimes work. you can run a sync will force to actually update the file system. Just sync. Yep. Okay. Well, let's try inserting data again. I did it into archive test. That's kind of bizarre. Did it get? Did it actually register that it got bigger? Well, let's be let's be old school. Sync, sync, sync. I just have to make sure not to type halt after that. Um, what if we do a select star? Does it, does it show up? Well, let's see. Yeah, shows up. String. Let's do a string. But again, it's knowing your tools because if your tool doesn't give you the right information because, you know, well, LS is doing the right thing, but the file system hasn't written it yet, you can actually make some wrong conclusions based on bad information. Um, so, uh, ARZ. Okay, well, we still got our header, which is still kind of weird in a data file, but now we've got this stuff. We don't actually have the actual rows. That's because Archive actually compresses the rows. So this is compressed data, just like when we were looking at foo.gz before. It was compressed data, so. That's how our archive works. Where are we going to? Um, so this is just the example we put in the slide. So how about a merge table? Let's see what a merge table looks like. Um, I'm creating those merge things. And uh, let me just see. OK. Um, so if I do create table, mrg1, id int. So a merge table is a, the old school way to do partitioning before, um, before MySQL 5.1. And basically what it does is it's a wrapper around my isom table. So they have to be my isom. So I'm creating two of the exact same structure, my isom tables. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a wrapper around them called merge test. Um, and basically what you do is you define the structure and it has to be the same as the underlying files. And then you define a union. Union equals MRG1, MRG2. You could space separate them if you want. And I have to actually do the engine as well. Is that not even, that's not even on the uh, slide there. I should change that. Engine equals merge. Union equals MRG1, MRG2. Um, if I do, uh, you know, show create table uh, merge test, it's going to show me the ID. And it shows me actually the union of MRG1, MRG2. Okay. Uh, see, finally, archive test actually got updated, by the way. Finally, actually, 1416 was the FRM file, so that didn't change. But 1419, the data actually had gone in. So it took a while to, to, for it to, to actually write that. So at 1420, we made all these merge tables. Here are the MySIM tables for MRG1, MRG2. Um, merge test has an MRG and an FRM. Now, the merge table itself doesn't have any data. It's just pointers to the underlying tables. So let's see what um, what lies beneath. Okay. Well, we just have a merge my ISM table uh, again. ID would show up if uh, I did strings dash n two because it's uh, there. We go. So you actually see the field ID. Um, and let's do merge strings merge test dot mrg to see what's in there. Okay, merge one and merge two. That makes sense. It's the underlies the pointers. That's where we're pointing to. So um, let's uh, change the order and see what happens. Like, does it always put it in order or not? Let's figure that out. So alter table uh, archive test union equals. Thank you. Thank you. Merge test. If I had a prize, I would like be throwing them out, but. Uh, the books are not out yet, and they're like five, they're eight, like 800 pages, so they would be hard to throw. Injuries. MRG1. <laughs> okay. And so now we look at here, and it says MRG2, MRG1. So in fact, the merge table does it in order, which makes sense, because there's actually an importance to the order. Yes? Can you pipe it to sort? Can I what? Pipe it to sort. Can I pipe it to sort? I sure could. I could pipe it. Uh, oh, I don't know if it will do it in, yeah, I guess it will, you know. Um, 
you need dash C or dash, dash C. I can do that. I can pipe it into. Uh, so yeah, basically, it just escapes whatever whatever's on the rest of the line. It sends the command line. So you could do it to sort. Um, for this particular case, it's actually the um, showing that the merge table actually the MRG file actually shows the order of it. So you wouldn't want to do a sort on this. Just although if you have like a whole bunch of tables in in the uh, wrapper script in the wrapper of the merge table, you want them in alphabetical order. That would be a way to to get them really easily. It depends whether you want to see what you want to see is the order of it or what tables exactly are contained within it. I think that, yep, yeah, that's that slide. So now um, Patrick can say some stuff about. Yes, now we move on to inodb files. inodb has two ways that you can run it in basically. First is the default way that most MySQL installations come installed. And that's with a single table space file. With a single table space file, you have your data, your indexes, and also the data dictionary, the internal inodb data dictionary contained within that, those table space files. You can have one or two of them, depending on what your setup is. Or you can go with file per table. With file per table, you still have your single table space files, and those contain the data dictionary and how the database is structured. But you also, in addition to that, you have um, IBD files. These are fi individual table space files containing data and indexes for each table. Um, and you can change a running, uh, running setup to use t file per, per, um, table per file. And it actually can be beneficial to you because it can allow you to defragment your database. A lot, a lot of people are now using this setting. Um, whereas with the single table space files, you can't shrink the size of your table space, but with IBD you can. Um, in this slide here, you can see, uh, you know, it shows you the, t the two table space files. Um, um, to change it so that you, when you switch to table per file, you put it in your my.cnf and restart, your existing tables are still going to be contained within that s those single table space files or single table space file. In order to force the issue and cause these tables to go to you know, individual table space files, you can do a, what's called a no-op, alter table. And, and in this case, what you do is the alter table states engine equals inodb. It doesn't really do much, but what it does do is it forces the recreation of it, these tables so that they rebuild with a single table space for each table. Um, so let's show, uh, we're going to show, you know, the metadata about this. So we've got uh, show global variables. Like I did, at first I want to make sure that we have InnoDB before we start doing this. Can I see that? Or, uh, oh, you know, the, this. Oh, well, I'm sorry. Did you want to do it? Or I'll let you do it. You have a clean, my database is yeah, full of junk. My <laughs> database is clean. So, uh, we, which first, before we start, we want to make sure we have InnoDB because if you create an InnoDB table and you don't have InnoDB enabled, it will just create it with the default table type. Um, and it'll give you a warning, but it won't stop you from doing it. So then I want to see, do we have InnoDB file per table? We have it off, okay. Um, so let's, uh, alter table states to uh, InnoDB. Okay, um, so now we should be able to see the IB data file here. Now it hasn't been written to yet because my, uh, InnoDB has a lot of like in-memory buffers and things like that, so I don't expect it to be written yet. But this is the IB data file that is eventually going to be uh, written to. And, and the MYI and MYD files that previously existed for my ISIM are now gone. Right, let's uh, check the, yeah, there's just a states.frm now. There's no MYI and MYD, which makes sense because it, all the data and indexes are in, in fact, the IB data file. So um, we can just do a MySQL dump dash p root pass. My root password on my, my machine for MySQL is root pass, so everyone knows that now. Um, Pre root pass, what do we want to do? We want to dump the, uh, the test database. We should dump the whole thing, but literally I only have the uh, test databases on it, so uh, let's just do the whole thing. Um, all databases piped into uh, dump.sql. Uh, oh, it doesn't like the... It, could, the it was unable, I should drop the federated table because it's unable to connect to the foreign data source. Um, 
test, drop table, fed, test. Okay, and so now we're going to change the my.cnf and uh, go to mysql d and change this to, let's say, you know, db file per table. And you just put it in there. You don't have to say equals on or not. Can you? Uh, well, let's see. Since this is a development machine, um, I believe you can, but uh, we'll see. If it gives me an error and says, I don't know what you're talking about. Okay. And let's... Okay, it's now on. Great. So now we can um, look, now what we need to do is we uh, want to put in the back the dump. And so, because right now what we're doing is we've set this up to say, okay, I'm going to be file per table now. But now we need to re-import all the data because it's still in the single table space shared IB data file. So MySQL. Like I said, you could do it with alter table. The, the, the most assured way to do it is to do it this way. The one gotcha that if you do all your tables that if you had, for instance, 10 gigabit um, table space files and you thought, well, if I switch the table for file, these will shrink, they won't. You'd have to reload your, your, your entire database for them to, if you wanted to make them smaller and you know, let all your data be inside the IBD files. And in fact, now we have states.ibd. So let's do a string. Actually, let's do a file and see what it shows. State.ibd. It's data. Okay. We don't get like, you know, my ISIM compressed data or anything. It just says data. Um, and the strings, you know, it's got some more stuff than it had before. So, you know, just interesting stuff. I don't think we can really base any conclusions on it like we could. You, before. you know what you can see in there, actually? I was just looking at sure. that. Is you can see there's two entries for each data, and that's because of the indexes in the data. Right, they're together. And that's the one difference with InnoDB is because you have the clustered indexes. So, yes? One thing, since you talk about dumping to, it, to an InnoDB to file the table and save space in an IB data file is, even if you do that, it's still not going to shrink your IB data file. Right, right, and that's why we had to dump and reload. We had to, well, what I should have done is actually Where dropped all of the InnoDB data. You, you're absolutely right. What I should have done is I should have dropped all of the databases with InnoDB files in them or started with a new one. Um, because you're right, you're absolutely that wouldn't that wouldn't change it. You have to delete them in the directory. Right. You don't have to delete them in the directory. You have to drop them. If you delete them in the, you have to do it through the database. If you just drop them, the shared table space. If you just delete the shared table space, that, actually, what I would do is I'd move the shared table space out of the way. Yeah. But then it's gonna it's gonna have to reinitialize the shared table space. So. There are a lot of dependencies with InnoDB. Yeah. It's tricky. Ma yeah. Many ways in which to shoot your foot. Exactly. So yeah, probably stopping the server, moving all of the EnoDB information out of the way, including the log files, because you don't want it to try to, you know, restore any information or whatever. So just move the log files and the data files out of the way, and then do an EnoDB per table. And when it starts up, it'll actually have to reinitialize the table, the shared table. So thank you for that. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, so. As interesting as all this stuff is, let's move on to something a little more salient. You want to? Yes, we're uh, talking about smoke now. Yeah. Temporary, temporary tables. Temporary tables, of course, many of you know, are tables you create and they exist for your session. If you close your session, they go away. Um, they are created within the directory that you specify in your my.cnf, which defaults to tenth. You can it can be pretty much anywhere. You can also have it so that they're created in memory. Um, in this example, we uh, we show that uh, you can do a you can look inside of temp for pound SQL star. That's what they're created as. They always well, have that name. I want to make sure that temp is actually my. Um, oh, yeah, that's a good idea. Otherwise, we'll be looking in a directory where we won't like find what we expect. Tempter or something, but uh, yeah, the tempter is in fact temp, which is good. So, so we'll create a temporary table called foo. And okay, actually temp, it's going to show up as pound SQL. So 
There's no such file or directory of pound SQL. Um, where it should be in there. <laughs> no, we haven't made it yet. Oh, we haven't. Okay, I, I, I was looking at this while you were. Actually, I think, there we go. It's now created these, let's do an ls-l, and in fact it created it at, you know, 1433, which it is right now, and it's your usual myisom, which is interesting to know, when you do a create temporary table, it's a myisom table. We well, can't see the right part of the screen. You cannot see the correct part of the screen? The right part. Right. Where the, uh, oh. Oh, okay. Um, let me change the font size. Can I change the font size a little smaller? Would that be okay? Yeah, I know. And if I make the font size smaller, it won't be cut off because it'll. You, oh, I could minimize the window. We trust you. Okay, we trust you. That's uh, dangerous to do, right? What? But then you can't see the time that it was changed. I mean, I can do, yes, I can do an ls without the l. There's some flag in there that'll give you just the time, I'm or sure. Or ls-1 I can do. Yeah. Um, huh? Dash t? No, t, um, t orders it by time. But it doesn't actually show you the time. So, anyway, thank you for that. And if it uh, goes off screen again, let me know. Um, or actually, let me. Yeah, does that get you to the end of the screen? Let me see exactly where the end of the screen goes. There we go. Okay. Now, if I don't say, hey, this is not good enough, I'll. Uh, all right. So, that's the user created temporary tables. We want to insert in some data now. It's going to act like a MySum table, but. Into food values uh, one one two two and then you know do an ls dash l um, we would be able to see oh yeah now it's uh, scrolling down so just as if it were a regular right now we see the data's changed there's no index change because there's no indexes on it. could even alter it and do things with it. Right. And the, the interesting thing to think about while we're, I just thought of this that worth mentioning is what do you do if you alter a temporary table? Does it create another temporary table to do the alter? And from my work on storage engines, yes it does. So um, there are temporary tables of temporary tables. Right, because when you have a large intermediate result for query, like if you're doing an alter table and it's a very long alter table, it has to put that data somewhere. So it's locking the table, and it's actually making a copy of the table with the new changes that you've done in alter table. And if you look in your temporary database directory, you'll actually see these pound SQL files. So that's not something that you want to necessarily delete, because if somebody's doing a huge alter that takes 10 minutes, um, and you delete the file, they're going to be unhappy. <laughs> My yeah. SQL is going to get an error, and yeah. Um, Although it's also actually very useful because we actually had a case where somebody was doing a very large query, a very large select query, basically taking a couple of million rows and doing a cross-join against itself. And you could see this intermediate data file growing and growing and growing until it ran out of disk space. And the first time it happened, you know, we got paged saying, hey, there's no disk space. And the customer called us going, my query died. <laughs> because the query died because it ran out of space. And MySQL said, oh, sort of ordered. I don't know if anyone's seen sort aborted in their in their thing. That's one of the reasons they could do that. Usually it's uh, not that because you know because MySQL is not very happy when the disk runs out of space. Um, but that's you know that was just kind of interesting. We're like yeah well, we know your query got aborted. Thanks you know like you just did this huge sort and they were like well when can I do it so it works and we're like well when you get another like 30 gigabytes of data space on your thing because that's how much it needs. So we ended up making the query, you know, not look at all the records and do cross joins, but just, you know, the last month or something. But so that works for not just user created temporary tables when you actually want to create a temporary table and do it on purpose, but when MySQL itself makes that temporary table for alters or intermediate queries. I'm curious what we do if we make this INODB the actual temp table. I think, uh, yeah. Maybe when at the end, or something like that, we can. When you, um, when you, what I believe happens is um, that the you know, DB will handle that, but. Uh
that's certainly something to uh, look at for. Does anyone know what happens if you like alter an EnoDB table? You do get, I think you do get temp tables, but they're not, I don't think they're my ISO. If, if you alter an EnoDB, like you alter the table on an EnoDB table, it, like my experience is we're running file for table, <coughs> the temporary table is in fact in EnoDB table. So it's in, yeah, so what the comment was, was when you do an alter table on an EnoDB table, at least when you're using file per table, you get a temporary .ibd file. Um, with Falcon, I remember when I was working on Falcon, we had to figure out how to, we didn't want things to be put in, because it creates a schema name called temp. And there was no temp schema within the Falcon underlying table space. So we were trying to figure out how do we do temp tables and get it to work. So you know, that's one of MySQL inner workings. You know, a lot of things are kind of depend on it being temp. And I'm, I'm guessing that Oracle, pro I mean, uh, <laughs> Oops. <laughs> well, I know DB or <laughs> whatever. Um, tree it has a temporary schema within the the I know DB table space. Yep. That'll be another talk. <laughs> oh, okay. Thank you very much. Okay. System variables. Uh, there are numerous ways of setting system variables. You can set them at uh, startup, either with a MySQLD dash dash command line option. Uh, you can also put them in the my.cnh option file. Many of them you can set dynamically. You can, while you're connected, you can change them. Uh, recently, I was at work and we were trying to figure. We had a problem. I was doing a big data import. I was uh, migrating an application from Oracle to MySQL, and we were running the data import. We had 400,000 records, and we were at 380,000. I was excited. We were almost done, and it blew up because it said uh, max. You know. Um, max packet size. I was building dynamic in insert statements. I was doing bulk inserts and I guess the one I built was a little too large so like well we could restart MySQL but we can't. We have all these running apps. So what we did was we changed uh, uh, max allow packet dynamically. So many of them you can do like that. If you go to uh, the MySQL manual there's this wonderful page here and I bookmarked it. switch to yours? What's that? Yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> He's forgetting that you don't see his window. So. The only thing I can remember right now is that there are 90 people looking at me. <laughs> um, this is a really great page. This tells you all about every variable you could ever want. It tells you whether it's command line, whether you can put it in the option file, whether it's a system bear or a status bear, the scope, whether it's global or session, um, whether it's dynamic or not. And this is a good thing to look at. I, um, if you want to know what you can change, what you can't change, whether you're connected, because sometimes you're, you, you're running something and you can't restart the database, you can't change your my.cnf, so can I change this through a session, through a global? And this page can help you out tremendously. One of the important differences um, between a status variable and a system variable, so a status variable is something that you would get from like show global status or show session status. So that's kind of easy to remember because, hey, status is status. It's a read-only variable because it's status. So um, actually, if you go back to yours, um, okay. one of the interesting things to note is that on this reference page, um, you have like status, is it a status, status variable? Yes. Dynamic, you'll see, is no. In fact, it's not even changeable, right? You can't change the number of aborted clients, right? You can't change the number of alter tables that have happened. That's an automatic counter within MySQL. That's not anything you can change. So when you see, you can see this whole section is all yes, 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 this happens to be the um, is it uh, status variable, um, then that. That's not to be confused with system variable, which is the thing you can change. So it's a little misleading because they're, they're both called variables, even though you can only change one of them. You can only change the system variables. And that's what you see when you see show global variables, or you look at the you know session variables in um, the information schema. And those could be changed or could not be changed. Most of them can be changed, like you see, um, you know, auto commit, auto increment offset, those can be changed. You get something like auto uh, backlog and that can't be changed. You know, base steer cannot be changed, that kind of thing. Okay. Or it's not, excuse me, it's not dynamic, sorry. It's not dynamic, so you have to restart MySQL. That's what dynamic means. You could set it on, whether you could set it on command line or not. I wish I could change the ones like aborted clients and connects. <laughs> Nobody's aborted, thanks. <laughs> you can actually reset many of them with oh, flush reset commands. them, yeah, but undo the problem? No. <laughs> yeah. So. Oh, I need 
to change the screen being. Oh, yeah. Um, there's a whole bunch of different ways to get this information, um, which they're all give you the same answer. Go ahead. Yeah, you can, uh, you can use information schema. <laughs> information schema is chock full of all kinds of information, everything you'd ever want to know. You know, originally MySQL didn't have information schema, but they implemented it because it's a, it's a common database standard. Standard. You know, it, it's kind of like eating your own dog food. You have a database. Why not have everything about the database in the database? And so that's what information schema is good for. You can do many of the show commands you're so familiar with by using information schema. Um, you can also um, you can also find out a variable or a set of variable. Um, Select at, at global dot max connections. You can also use show, show global variables like whatever string variable name you're looking for with the, the string pattern. In a, in a once bit and twice shy kind of view, you'll notice that I put global everywhere um, because at one point it, it had defaulted to whenever you say show variables and show status, it was defaulted to global, and then they changed it to default to session. So that kind of uh, messed with me because I was so used to just typing show variables. So now I just always type global because that way I know what I'm getting because if they ever change it back again, um, or it might be global now again, I don't remember. I just remember they changed it and it really messed me up. So now it's always global. If you wanted session, you just write session. It can't hurt to be explicit. Yeah. So. Um. Setting system variables. Um, of course you can set system variables with, the, with your configuration file, max connections. Um, you know, max packet length. Um, you can also set it, uh, set at, at global, uh, max connections. Uh, On the MySQL prompt line, yeah. Yeah, prompt. Um, you can do it um, in the show type syntax. You know, we say we call it show, but it's really actually set. You it's, know. you know, with like show global variables, it's set global. It's the same kind of equivalent. Um. Status variables. They're like system variables. Uh, the, the scope is global or session. They're read-only. That's the big thing about them. Um, they show you the status of the running system. You know, how is your system performing? What, what, what are the current settings? You know, how many aborted clients? Or uh, what's your, you know, what sort of, how many reads and writes, I believe? And yeah, comps How many queries? Yeah. Everything. Everything you'd want to know. There's, I think, over 300 of them. Let's, uh, I mean, there's about 300 uh, variables, too, so if we do show global variables. You said the pager. No, but it's 268 <laughs> rows. I mean, everything from, you know, version, ver I mean, there's four different um, variables for version, which are not really changeable, by the way, um, unless you've bumped with the source code, because, hey, that's a variable, but you can't, that's actually not a user changeable variable. Um, things like timestamp, you can't change, but like tempter, you can change. Um, Unique checks, updated. So there's 268 of those. Uh, the status variables. There's actually more. I think like three. Nope, 256. Oh, this is you know this is actually an older version. I was I've actually been playing with 6.0, and there's like 308 status variables. So everything you know, uptime. Um, you know how many scans have there been? Select scans. You know, obviously, I, you know, there's 371 questions, which seems like a lot considering I think I restarted this at the beginning of this demo. Um, this information is incredibly useful. You have, you have people, for instance, the, the math kit has tools that can process these. And also you have Nagios, which you have the, the not Nagios, but Cacti has some, some templates you can get that utilize a lot of this information and build lovely graphs. They have all kinds of graphs for it that utilize this. Obtaining or getting the values of status variables. Again, you can use information schema. Um, should you select the variable name from information schema dot global status or variable name equals whatever variable name you're looking for, you can query it. Um, and then of course you can use show. Um, and one of the things that uh, you can use is you actually use the status and the, and the variables to work together. Um, so for instance, this says show global variables like query cache. Right? And we're looking at this and we can see that the cache si query cache size here is something you can set. You can set how big the query cache is. Well, here's the status of all of the query cache stuff. And you see the free memory is, okay, well, s a little slightly less, 1675, 1677. I don't really have that much of the query cache, right? 
But now let's look and look at this with a critical eye, and let's say you don't know anything about the query cache at all. What can you deduce from just looking at this? Well, first of all, the query cache caches queries, right? It's what it does, but here you've got a queries in cache. You can actually see how many cat queries it actually cached. Um, the fact that it says queue cache free memory here, okay, well, it stores them in memory. It doesn't necessarily store them on disk somewhere and retrieves them. It actually keeps it in RAM. Um, there are, you know, hits to the cache. Okay, makes sense given how we know how caches work. There are inserts, okay. There's a low memory prune. Well, that's interesting. Okay, it prunes things when the memory gets low. What's low? I don't know. Maybe we can change that. Maybe we can't. Uh, from the variables here, it doesn't look like there's, you know, a percentage that you change it when the memory gets X low. Uh, but again, now you can see how does the query cache work? Well, it, you know, some queries are cached, some queries aren't. See, so this queue cache not cached. So it doesn't necessarily cache all queries. Caches some of them based on something or other. Again, if you read the manual, you figure it out. But this is just, but just by looking at what variables exist for, for status and for system, the things that you can change in the, and the data it shows you, you can actually get a sense of how it works, which is kind of neat. And that's, that's basically what it's all about. We can go into more, um, more examples later of you know, how to figure out how something works just by looking at the data, um, is specifically with the variables. But it's hugely, this is actually something that you do when you do a, a lot of query tuning, or a lot of um, server tuning, actually, is you basically, if you ever want the easiest uh, server tuning course out there, look at all the variables and look at all the status, figure out what they all mean by looking at the manual page, and by the time you've done that, you're like, oh, this does this, and my application does that, so I should tweak the parameter. You know, it'll take you probably five hours to do, um, but it's well worth it, and you basically end up learning a lot. Um, I still end up going to the manual for some, you know, sometimes you look at an obscure thing and you're like, why is that, why is that set at 16K anyway? What is that? And you go and you look at it. So It's a good feedback tool. Yeah. And there are, there are tuning, there are things that will tune for you out there, um, but nothing, there's nothing like looking at it yourself and getting a sense of, of everything. Um, so to get the status information, again, we were talking, you do show table status. Uh, so... Sorry, that's the, the status stuff. Are there uh, questions on glo on status variables or system variables? Um, okay, almost three o'clock. So instead of starting on uh, other table status and stuff, um, are there any other questions on anything? Do we want to maybe we could go into some more data with like uh, EnoDB uh, parameters? There's we can, a huge we can dig into the information of, uh, schema and have a question and answer session if you if you like. Uh, well, we do that after the break. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'm thinking of uh, if we do, you know, show uh, global variables like EnoDB uh, percent. Thank you. Uh, so there's 32 of them. There's a whole bunch of stuff there. Um, so you know, let's let's take them and look at it. Okay, additional memory pool size. Well, that's interesting. We have a whole bunch of memory pools, right? Not only do we have one, we have an additional one. Again. If we take the, I'm an alien from outer space and I'm looking at this metadata, I have no idea what the original memory is for, but I know that there's even additional memory. There's an auto-extend increment. Okay, we've seen auto-extend before when we looked at the uh, IB data, um, the data file path here. We've got auto-extend. So we can even look at that and say, aha, auto-extend increment is going to be 8. And the IB data file has auto-extend on um, you know, buffer pool size, so we say, okay, well, uh, EnoDB has some kind of big memory pool that it uses. Now, again, we know that it uses the buffer pool for storing, you know, data and indexes in memory, things like that. Um, EnoDB checksums, that's actually not something we looked into, but we were like, ah, oh, it has checksums. That's probably for the consistency and the ACID, the ACID compliance for, you know, having database integrity. It does checksums on, on everything, making sure it's, it's all changes. correct. Um, you know, commit concurrency, is that something we could change? Can we change, you know, set uh, EnoDB commit concurrency, set global, you know, uh, equal to one. Okay, I don't know what that just did, but, you know, it's, um, it's just interesting because now you go and you look it up, and you're like, oh, okay, EnoDB concurrency tickets. Um, this is actually, that's actually a very complex con um, concept, but uh, it's basically something that, um, a query will like get a ticket and it's in like a waiting period for a while and it has to do with, uh, I believe it has to do with deadlocking and stuff, but again, if you look at this kind of stuff, then you go to the manual and you're like, wow, you learn all this stuff. Um, you know, to be double write, it's got a double write buffer. And that's how what it uses for, it's, uh, you know, it's saving the data. It writes, it writes that it, 
it writes the data to a buffer so that if it if the disk dies, it's still going to be in the it's still going to be in the logs, um, and then the buffer will write to a log file. You know, it's this this whole thing. Um, it shows you how complex InnoDB is, uh, 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 as you're quickly seeing here. It does. InnoDB flush, flush logs a transaction commit. Um, a lot of people are familiar with this parameter because it's one of the first things that, that people end up optimizing. You can say um, zero to log it once per second um, to flush the logs, which means by flushing the logs, it's actually writing from the log file to the disk. Um, and you probably, you know, you don't want to be doing that all the time if you want you know, it to be performant so that the default is at one. Right. The default so that it does when the commit occurs, so that yeah, you know you can have some, you know, commits. And then, yeah. but th there's actually a dual meaning because it flushes the data to the log file, and then it will flush. It can force a flush the disk or not, or it doesn't force it, but it can do a flush of the disk or not. So, again, you know, we've got a, we've not only got a log buffer, but a log file. You know, that's not something MySum has. You know, and again, we can look at it and how and how um, how it all works. Um, you know, EnoDB support XA. If you're looking at this and you're like, man, I hope this database supports, you know, XA transactions. It does. Um, and again, you can turn it off, things like that. Um, let's see what the status is. Show global status like EnoDB. Because um, again, a lot of these you can uh, work together. Like percent, EnoDB, percent. You know, you have separate actual EnoDB um, you know, how many rows inserted, how many, you know, page size, how many pages were read, how many pages were written. Um, buffer pool weight free. Interesting. So there's something about, you know, waiting for buffer pool and free memory. Okay. Write requests. Okay. So we know that the Eno EnoDB doesn't write to the buffer pool right away. Or is that the write requests from the buffer pool to the disk? We'll have to look that up. Data F sync, data pending F sync, data pending reads, data pending writes. So you can see that. That, that EnoDB really doesn't, it doesn't, it really ends up queuing a lot of things. There's a lot of overhead involved in EnoDB because it's, it's ha it has all these places to, to put, you know, pending, how many pending reads have there been? How, you know, you don't have any pending reads in my ISOM. It's just kind of like, okay, there's pending reads for the operating system, give me the file, but. Um, it's a bit of a Rube Goldberg contraption. Yeah. No, in a good way. Um, <laughs> and a lot of it has to do with the fact that EnoDB does so many things that it, it takes advantage of memory so much, so much. But in order to do that, you have to have a lot of control and make sure that things are done in the right sequence. And yep. You got, you know, how many pa how many data pages do you have? How many dirty pa data pages? Which um, in uh, in uh, like memory theory, a dirty page is what it's been written to, right? And, but it hasn't been written to disk, so it's a dirty page because it has to actually be still be put to the disk. You know, how many pages have been flushed? How many pages are free? So you can see there's a lot that depends on. Um, organization of the memory itself, which is a lot more than you see, for instance, how, you know, what are the MyIsom specific things, nothing for status. I believe there's some for um, variables. And yeah, you've got, you know, data pointer size, Mac, but you've got seven rows, right, how many repair, uh, re does it, will it repair threads, the sort buffer size, um, you know, use the mmap, which is using the memory map, which is something new in 5.1. Um, you know, versus 32 different variables that you can set for EnoDB. So you could set 32 variables for EnoDB or seven variables for um, MyISOM. The interesting thing would be to see what uh, the new Maria storage engine, which is based off of MyISOM, how many new variables. Do you have that on your? I have. You switch it. I have access to it. Would you like to switch it? Um, sure. And then after this, we'll, uh, is it it's break time in a few minutes, right? Yes, no? Yeah. Okay, good. Because I was like, we don't have to go on a break if you guys don't want to. <laughs> okay, show global. Variables like percent or any other Ah, okay. So, let's make this. Oh, wow, my screen's on there. Do you want right. to Can you make it a little bigger? Yeah, we can. There's, so there's 15 different rows, so it's about half as complex as EnoDB. Um, and it's got block size, uh, log file size, so it also has a log file, log purge type. Okay, you could purge logs, that's kind of neat. You know, the log purge type is immediate, so you can even guess, okay, there's got to be a way to have a non-immediate um, one. And this is 5.1, Maria, so 6.0 might have, have even more. Have even more, you know, Maria recover, right? That's kind of, that's, oops, every time I click it's something different. So, 
um, just by looking at this, you can you can almost see the functionality of these things. You know, Maria doesn't have all the, as many as many memory um, as many memory things as uh, as that. So you can certainly answer questions if somebody says, "Gee, what do you think uh, Maria supports? Does Maria do this? Does it do that?" And you can kind of tell from this. Right. Even though we, we know nothing of you know, well, I know nothing. I know very little about Maria. Um, but if you don't, you know, max or file size, okay, you know, maximum size of a, you know, file that you can sort page, you know, it's got page checksum. So I, you know, we can wonder is that like the uh, my ISM checksum or is that like you know to be checksum? So all right. So well, what is Maria? Is it a table or a It's a storage or? engine. I'm storage. Yeah, it's a new storage engine. It's uh, still in. It's still not in general availability okay. yet. It right now it supports crash recovery. Uh, it's the intent is to make it uh, transactional. But the crash recovery is supposedly really incredible. Um, I remember hearing at the, their conference in Heidelberg, they uh, had a, a running database that they pulled the plug out, plugged it back in, and everything resumed just perfectly. And the, benefit, the, the beauty of it is that it's based on MyISAM, which is, everybody knows MyISAM's really fast. That's what it's known for, particularly with reads. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, Great. and it's moving along rather quickly. Thank you. If you guys have any questions during the break, you can come up and uh, let us know. Thank you so much for now, and um, I'll work on uploading these slides during the during the break so that we can uh, get them to you.